Your Excellency, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for being here. Not, mu not much is certain at the moment, except we live in complicated, very complicated times. So over the next 15 minutes, we'll talk to the World Bank President about reforming one of the most important institutions of our time and making it fit for purpose. We'll also try to understand how he views the world economy, what's the most important price in the global economy right now. Is it the price of oil, the price of semiconductors, and more important than that, it's probably the price of money. So I'm delighted to welcome on stage Ajay Banga, who took over as president of the World Bank about 150 days ago, but you've been very busy. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Francie. Ajay, you, you've just come from Marrakesh, right, for, for your first annual uh, IMF World Bank meetings, where you gave a very impassionate speech about the need to reform the World Bank. What will you focus on? So I actually didn't come from Marrakesh. I went back to the U.S. and came here, which just makes it even more complicated. <laughs> but the, um, I think the most important thing at the World Bank right now is the fact that we've changed the mission and vision of the bank. It used to be very focused on poverty alleviation and, in fact, sharing prosperity. What I've tried to say is the world's intertwined crises of pandemics and climate change and fragility do not allow for a focus only on poverty. You have to deal with these in a composite way. So the new mission of the World Bank is to focus not just on eradicating poverty, but on a livable planet. And then that then focuses on uh, women and young people. Women because half the world's population cannot be on the sidelines. Saudi is doing an amazing job of increasing more women in the labor force. Many countries are not in that situation. And young people, because the global south is full of young people, and their hopes and aspirations are our future only if they get quality of life when they're growing up and they get a job. And I think we need to make sure we are focused on getting those done. And I know you're extremely ambitious in what you, you can achieve, but if, if you look at the setback of normalization, um, in the region, it talks on ice of the normalization. It's also set back for economic development. So how does it impact your ambition? Well, I, right now, there's so much going on in the world, in geopolitics, in the wars that we are seeing, in what just happened recently in Israel and Gaza. At the end of the day, when you put all this together, I think the impact on economic development is even more serious because I feel like the world economy, while everything looks better than we expected it to look in the developed world some time ago, I think we're at a very dangerous juncture in where it could go. Secondly, from my own perspective at the World Bank, I think there is a growing divergence between the developing economies and the developed world. I'm quite concerned about the gap that's originating between the global south and the global north. These are things that you know, President Ruto is sitting here. He will speak to you in great eloquence about that. But it worries me enormously. And we talked briefly about the cost of money. But when you look at the biggest risk, is it geopolitics for the world economy? Oh, right now? Yes. But, you know, risks tend to move around. I'd be very careful of fixating on one and ignoring the others. Right now, that is true. But I would say, if you listen, when Yasser was speaking, he was talking about a very different economy where interest rates are probably going to stay a little higher for longer, if you would believe that today. The U.S. 10-year Treasury just crossed 5% briefly yesterday. This is areas we haven't seen. So, yes, that is right there lurking in the shadows. And then how long before the next pandemic? What do you think? That's the <laughs> issue. So I think I'd be careful trying to bottle risks up into yeah. one thing or the other. I just believe the world has got too much yeah. interlinked, too composite, to play around with one risk versus the other. But you mentioned the next pandemic, and let, let's hope it's not here anytime soon. We've gone from pandemic to Ukraine to now what's happening between Hamas and Israel. What, how many more shocks actually can, can the world sustain? Well, the world seems to be very resilient, and I think that's the optimism. And that the fact is that despite everything that has already been thrown at us over the last few years, I think the world is in a better place today than even someone like me or others in this audience thought just six months ago. As I said, careful with the developing world, the debt issues there, their challenges with energy transition, their feeling of being left behind when they should be growing. Those are very serious challenges. Don't discount those. But on the whole, the world economy is in a better place. So the challenges you're talking about, climate, fragility, poverty, inequality, of course, uh, the cost of that is probably one trillion U.S. dollars a year. How will you get that? 
I mean, that's just a trillion dollars for renewable energy in the emerging markets, is the estimate. If you add up all the different things that we need to get done, it's many multiples of that. There is not enough money in government coffers or even in the multilateral development banks. We do, at the end of the day, need to involve the people in this room, the private sector with their capital, their ingenuity, and their innovation, and their people. And that's one of the biggest tasks that we've all got ahead of us. It's not like waving a magic wand and saying, everybody's signed up, and if it's X trillion, they're going to come. I think you need to really figure out what is it you need to get done. So for example, if you're looking to bend the curve on carbon emissions, what you need to do is focus on a few markets where the growth in their emissions, if allowed to pursue with the prior model, will far exceed what would come down in the developed world. That's not 100 countries. It's 10 or 15 of them. But if you get away from carbon emissions and you start talking about adaptation and biodiversity and soil degradation and water, now it's a much larger group of countries that need our help and thinking. So I think you just have to break the problem down into those components. So, so how will you put private money to work? <laughs> If it were that easy, I would have made a magic wand. But I've collected a group of people together to help us into a private sector lab. A number of them are actually sitting in this room. And the effort is to try and learn from them what kind of things the World Bank could do to enable a better opportunity for them to invest in this change. We're starting with renewable energy and energy infrastructure. As we heard the first time around, there's an issue with political risks in some of these economies. At the other end, there's a foreign exchange risk. The political risk, there's things the bank can do to help with, from regulatory policy to insurance guarantees. FX is a much more complicated topic. It requires, ultimately, local capital markets, local lending and the like. But you know, between here and there, there's many steps to be taken. It's interesting because you came from the private sector. So yes. what's, how does that change your lens, actually? And what, again, what you can offer in doing either uh, partnerships between private and public or just putting private money to better use? I, I don't think the fact that I came from the private sector changes the realization of the need for the private sector to be a deep player in this game. It's just the reality. I think what it does give me is a bunch of networks of people and the comprehension of what my life used to be like and the challenges we face in investing in difficult circumstances and the opportunity that that can create. What I think I also understand is how easy it is for the private sector to be misunderstood when they're trying to do things. And therefore, trying to find a way to thread that needle is where I think I can be helpful. What's the biggest barrier, actually, in private trying to invest in some of your projects? Is it really the cost of money, or is it because they're, they're just right now in a little bit of a wait-and-see situation? No, I think the first barrier is still political risk in some of these countries. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you're going to invest in renewable energy, and you don't know what the downstream utility is going to pay you, two years from now if the administration changes or they decide to change the terms of their contract with you, it's very difficult for you to invest in a 10, 20, 30 year project when you don't know what your revenue stream could look like in the coming period. I think that at the end of the day is the single biggest challenge. As I said, foreign exchange and how to manage that is another very big challenge. But there are others like that that need to be navigated through. Where do you think a lot of the money will, will go into? Again, is there the a, a sector that maybe seems more appealing because it's more stable? Well, you see, what the difference is now, over the last few years, both solar and wind and the likes of that geothermal, and again, President Ruto is the king of geothermal, 93% of the energy in Kenya is renewable, of which about half is geothermal, the other half is hydroelectric. And so, so there are energies now available where the technologies are proven to give you per unit cost lower in some cases than fossil fuel, but larger capital upfront and a longer gestation period, which brings us back to the political risk and the FX risk. But so you, that's where we've got to deal with this. And you feel private investors are listening? They are absolutely there. I would tell you that there are, there's no shortage of appetite yeah. in the private world to invest in some of these selected countries in carbon emissions avoidance. I think the real challenge remains a few hurdles to be crossed. Uh, we heard also uh, His Excellency talk a lot about AI. Does technology change help you facilitate maybe some of these projects? Look, technology and innovation are key to everything that's going on. I was speaking to Amin a little while ago about, about Aramco. I think people don't understand how much advance Aramco has made on carbon sequestration and capture. And the reality is if we do everything right with renewable energy and with the emissions from agriculture and those from heavy transport and those from construction, we're still going to need carbon sequestration and capture if you have a chance to meet the 2050 dates. 
So there's a lot of innovation, a lot of technology that's necessary. Without that, you know, the definition of insanity is from doing the same thing and expecting a different answer. That ain't yeah. going to work. Um, you have a lot of energy. You've always had a lot of energy. What would make your life easier right now from government? <laughs> Peace and stability. Apart from peace and stability, which is at, at the moment difficult to achieve? Uh, a degree of cooperation across governments that are willing to comprehend what the global south is going through right now. I think the change is real and imminent, and I think our future depends on them. Look at Africa. I was speaking to a bunch of African finance ministers and leaders the other day. I believe that is our future. It's going to be more than a billion five people. It is people who are young. It is their optimism, their dynamism. It is their access to minerals. They've got land. They've got water. They've got so many things that could work to lift the growth for GDP over the next few years. But I think if we don't harness what's going on there and try and make it easier for society to benefit there, then shame on us. Because otherwise, we're leaving the next 20 years on the table if we're not careful. And the World Bank, of course, has a huge role to play. Who else? It does. Half our book is in Africa. Half our efforts are in Africa. We're trying to do a great deal of work there, both on the development part of it, but also on trying to help with the debt crisis. There we don't play a, a principal role, but we play a role that people don't comprehend, which is along with the global sort of sovereign debt roundtable that we in the IMF run, we're actually the biggest source of grant and concession financing to countries in distress. And so that kind of is really helpful. The four countries that have ended up in the G20 common framework for global debt, which is Ghana, Zambia, Ethiopia, and Chad, those four have received from the bank in the last three to four years, 12 billion of financing of which half was free. The other half is heavily concessional. Seven billion of that is net positive. Zambia, since June or July, ever since it got the deal signed with its creditors, is basically getting grant money. There is no other way to help these countries get out of the situation. You could say they could have been more thoughtful of the debt they went into. The reality is the movement of interest rates and the way foreign exchange has changed on them is way beyond their capacity to manage with their current circumstances. They need to do work on domestic resource mobilization, on policy and all the like. Don't get me wrong. But we need to be there for them with a hand on their back because otherwise we have a real problem in the coming decade. But do you worry, and you said there's a lot of capital out there, do you worry that the next couple of months will be so volatile that actually private you know, lenders will stay on the sidelines until th they understand the situation a little bit better? I think there's so much capital out there still looking for positive deployment that it'll find its way to the right opportunities. Like I said, risk is not a single risk, it's a set of composite risks and some locations are more attractive to invest in. Money will flow where those opportunities come. I think countries have to be competitive about attracting that money. That's why the right policies, the right regulations are very much a part of the roadmap that countries need to take on. You can't just say, come to me and give me the money. It needs the work that's required. But, but I do believe money will be put to work. Do you worry that climate change is no longer at the forefront of investors' minds for a number of reasons, including, of course, geopolitics and volatility? No, I think climate change is an existential reality. And if you want your grandchildren to have a good life, please don't let it get off the front of your minds. It is very real. It needs to be dealt with. And the reality is, further than that, is that I think the developed world is beginning to get its arms around issues. I was reading articles in the developing world as well about the change in reforestation and the like. There's progress. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be pessimistic about the progress, but we need a lot more to get done. There's some very simple things that don't need a lot of money. For example, the way in which you grow rice can completely change the methane emissions from rice. And methane emissions from rice are 20% of methane. That half of that can come down just by planting the rice differently and adding water to the field differently and not leaving it in there. The problem is farmers in most countries don't know that the water will come back when they need it for the harvesting. And therefore, if you can solve for these problems, those are not as expensive as some forms of renewable energy, but everything adds up. And all I'm trying to get across to people is don't lose sight of the things you can do while trying to talk about how much money is required for the other ones. There's a whole suite of things we can play with. Ajay, as a final question, what are you most optimistic about in, in these difficult times? Young people. I think their, their energy and their dynamism is what will take us forward.
Ajay Banga, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Francis. Thank you.